Okay. All right, our next speaker is from Indiana University, Purdue University, Indianapolis, IUPUI, Dr. Jennifer Giuliani. Okay. Close enough. She is an assistant professor of history at IUPUI, and she works with digital history, digital humanities, and she is going to tell us about the, the possibilities and perils of digitizing. With that, I'll give you Dr. Giuliani. All right, so this um, talk is titled The Promise of Digital History, but really what I like to call it is all the cool shit, um, <laughs> which sounds really weird. Um, all the cool shit you can do with digital history that no one's ever going to tell you about, um, or will tell you about later on when you become a professor like I do. Um, so I want to start actually with something super simple, which is what is digital history? Who can define or give me some ideas of what digital history is? <laughs> history that's digital, okay. History that's online. History that might be online, what else? Computerized. History that's computerized or that deals with computers, right? So digital history can be about studying how computers are built, how they operate, what they do. My favorite example of that is, um, have you guys ever heard of a male and female computer port? Yes. Yeah. There's an example of digital history. How did you get there, and why is one called a male and one called a female? Because uh, perverted computer programmers decided to simulate sex. That's really what it was about, right? Okay, what else? What else is digital history? What else is digital history? So it can be things you see on the screen. So it can be things like apps, or maps, or visualizations. What'd you get? It can be things like doing work like Google, right? So it can be things like searching the internet and coming up with things that operate on the internet. So things like digitizing photos or doing family history, all of those things are digital history. And so today what I'm gonna show you is some cool digital history, um, things that I like to play with or talk about. So we're gonna start with this. Who is this? Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln. Here's a form of digital history about Abraham Lincoln. Who knows what this is? This is the photo, famous photo of Abraham Lincoln at Gettysburg. A historian wants to argue about who are the people in the photo and where they were placed because one of the biggest questions historically is, is there actually a photograph of Abraham Lincoln giving his famous speech at Gettysburg? Why do historians care about that? Because it was one of the most important speeches in America. Not only was it one of the most important speeches in American history, but Abraham Lincoln wasn't even the keynote speaker that day. He spoke so shortly and with so little interest from the public that most people never paid attention to him. So the guy who spoke that day, the keynote speaker, um, Edward Everett right there, who's hard to see because of the photo, talked for something like four and a half hours long. Could you imagine listening to someone for four and a half hours? So much of the photographs that are produced in this period are of him talking and talking and talking, talking and talking and talking. More importantly for our purposes, this photo actually gets discovered, I think it's like eight or nine years ago now. Originally they thought that Abraham Lincoln was the cowlick aid man. And they discovered through new forms of digitization that in fact, that over there is Abraham Lincoln. And that's part of what digital history can be, is refining or reconfiguring what we know. So let's talk a little bit about Gettysburg. This is the original um, Hay transcription of Abraham Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. So basically he wrote it out long form in cursive. With digital history, we can do something called optical character recognition. What that is is a form of a computer algorithm that reads this letter and attempts to turn it into a plain text file, right? So we all know this story, right? Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. So digital historians, like we got from the original document to the transcription, what digital historians like to do is argue. I don't know if you've noticed, but history is just a lot of arguments and a lot of people having arguments, right? Um, and we like to do it with our words instead of our fists, although I have seen fist fights between historians, <laughs> right? So I, as a digital historian, want to have an argument with another digital historian about the word liberty, which I've circled up there. 
And the dictionary tells me liberty is the state of being free within society from oppressive restrictions imposed by authority on one's way of life, behavior, or political views. That's your standard definition from a dictionary, right? The only problem with that is I don't know if Abraham Lincoln actually consulted a dictionary. I actually, as a digital historian, by looking through the index of books that Abraham Lincoln owned and had in his office, might decide to define liberty through his definition that he used with Alexis de Tocqueville. Who knows what Alexis de Tocqueville is? Any ideas? Alexis de Tocqueville is a famous lawyer and philosopher who in 1853, I think it's 1853, decided that it'd be great to come over from Europe and tour America. So he went to Cincinnati, he went to Cleveland, he went to like all the major cities. But as he traveled America, he also went to major prisons. He was fascinated with American prisons. And what he wanted to know was, what was the correlation between democracy and prison? Freedom, liberty, and imprisonment. So he goes back to France, he writes this really fa famous book about the applications of prisons to France. Um, and then he realizes that what he really wants to talk about is this idea of democracy in America. And Alexis de Tocqueville basically writes and says, here's the deal. American individualism is a great thing. It requires this thing called a social contract. Everybody has to get along together. And if we all agree that we're all working towards the same goal, that's how we have liberty. So basically, it's consensus. Government by consensus. So maybe Abraham Lincoln was drawing from Alexis de Tocqueville and saying, we need to govern by consensus, that liberty is about consensus and building community. Or maybe he was pulling from the Continental Congress, which in 1774 coined the phrase, life, liberty, and the pursuit, of happiness. the pursuit of happiness. So Thomas Jefferson's idea. So maybe what he was talking about was being conceived in liberty is actually about freedom from tyranny, freedom from a king, freedom from George in particular. Or maybe what he's saying is he's drawing from an 1855 letter to his friend Joshua Speed. Joshua Speed was a contemporary of Lincoln's. They were lawyers together. Um, some people like to argue that they had a little bit too intimate of a relationship. Um, but basically what this is is a letter that Lincoln writes to Speed in 1855. Um, and what he's talking about is basically his political allegiance, right? So when Lincoln takes over as president, he's sort of um, a consensus candidate is probably a, a right way to say it. Um, and so part of what he writes and he says, when it comes to this, I should prefer immigrating to some country where they make no pretense of loving liberty. To Russia, for instance, where despotism can be taken pure and without the base alloy of hypocrisy. What do you think he means by that? What do you think the, the hypocrisy is that he sees going on? What starts the Civil War? What are some of the causes? He basically says, how can we be a nation if we are a nation that are about oppressing others? He'd rather us not pretend to be nice about it and just go straight to despotism. Like, don't pretend you're doing nice things for people when you're not doing nice things for people, right? So as a digital historian, basically, I can argue any of those three conditions and what's cool about this is I can actually have a computer do it for me. So by digitizing all of those documents and feeding them into a computer, it can tell me how often Lincoln used to Tocqueville, how often Lincoln used the letter to Joshua Speed, how often he cited the papers of the Continental Congress. And by doing that, I get a better idea of what Lincoln actually meant when he talked about being conceived in liberty. Interesting enough, for those of you guys who like the Bible, the fourth option is Psalm 51, where King David talks about his adultery to Bathsheba, and he basically is apologizing for being an adulterer and sleeping around. And he says, I am not conceived in sin. What was the great sin of America in the period? Slavery. Slavery, right? So these are all ways you can digitize and do work. But that's not really the cool stuff you can do. This is the cool stuff you can do. In 1871, the British abolitionist David Livingstone goes to Africa, and he's stuck in this tiny, tiny little town in Africa, and he's supposed to be keeping a journal. But he runs out of ink, and he runs out of paper in his journal. So what he starts doing is writing over top of the standard newspaper, which was delivered with their food and meals, basically, right? So he has basically old newspapers, the kind that we would sort of use as 
you know, throwaways in the bottom of the cat tray or, or whatever. And he writes all of this. Why is David Livingstone important to us? Why do we care about what he'd written on top of the standard? Not only is he an abolitionist, but it just so happens that on one day during his stay there in 1871, he witnesses between four and 500 Africans being massacred by Muslim traders from Zanzibar, which is the biggest massacre in history at that moment that he had ever heard of or ever seen. That's what this document is. So we can do something really cool with this. You can actually do this in your science lab. We can use something called hyperspectral imaging. We can actually change the frequency of light waves. So who remembers Roy G. Biv? Yeah. Roy G. Biv? Okay, with Roy G. Biv and a really popular way of doing this digitally, you plug Roy G. Biv in and it rotates through the non-visible light spectrum, the things we can't see with human eyes. And it reveals his writing. So we have a first-hand account of murders of four to 500 Africans by Muslim traders in Africa at a moment when the British were asking themselves whether or not they should be involved in Africa at all. Cool, right? So this is kind of interesting, but it can get even more complex or more interesting. Let's see if my pretty will load. There it goes. This is alchemy in 3D. Who knows Jackson Pollock, the artist? What's about Jackson Pollock? That's a good, that's a good hand, right? Jackson Pollock is a modernist painter or postmodernist painter, depending on who you ask. This is the work of Jackson Pollock. In Pisa, Italy, they're using algorithms to do what's called 3D terrain mapping. So how many of you guys read, like go hiking or like go out with the Girl Scouts or Boy Scouts or you know, like with your family to hike, right? What do you do with terrain mapping? What does terrain mapping tell you? Elevation. Elevation, so you know whether you're going up or down. It also tells you what else? What happens if a storm starts? Where to run, basically. It, it will tell you low-lying areas. It will tell you bodies of water. It basically is a way of encoding the land in, a, in an easy form. What this group of people did is they created a 3D model of Jackson Pollock's painting. So what you're watching is the computer algorithm actually map the entirety of the painting. Why does this matter? Why might a historian want to map the work of Jackson Pollock? They want to know what order the layers came in, which is a signature of authorship, right? So by doing this type of mapping, I can begin to tell you whether something is a real Jackson Pollock or a fake Jackson Pollock, because it will tell me things like the age, not of just of the painting, but also how many of you guys are left-handed? All right, when you write, you place pressure on a pen or a palette knife a different way than the people that are next to you that are right-handed. Just the same way when blood drops, blood drops go in a certain way, right? These are signatures that you can begin to identify using 3D terrain mapping. This, by the way, is how they catch people who are counterfeiters and forgers, is that they can actually use this 3D technology to say, this was Jackson Pollock's hand doing the work, or this was someone imitating Jackson Pollock's hand doing the work. Cool, right? This is digital history in the same way those oral history interviews are that you're doing. And to give you a sense of how cool this can be with hyperspectral imaging and 3D terrain mapping, the image on the left is a painting painted by a famous painter in 1901. Any guesses as to who the painter is? Pablo Picasso. This is his famous blue period painting. So he painted all in one color for a period of time in, American his in his history. Um, they took hyperspectral imaging and 3D reconstruction and they stuck this under a digital microscope and they found out there's actually another painting underneath. Man with a Beard is the title of the painting. How is this significant for history? There's an unknown Picasso, which Picassos are ridiculously expensive, but also what else does it tell us about how Picasso was painting and doing his work in 1901? When he didn't like it, he just painted over it. 
right? But it also tells us something else. Materials were expensive in 1901, so he wasn't going to waste a canvas with something he didn't like. By the way, they've done this with the Mona Lisa and all kinds of other paintings and discovered hundreds, if not thousands, of what they call hidden paintings. So think about this with your own art. How many times do you erase something and do it again? I saw lots of you erasing your forms, right? Erasing and correcting. With technology like this, we can actually tell what you wrote first and what you wrote second which tells us what you're thinking or what errors you might have made. So, we're going to turn up sound a little bit. Can you hear that? of the city. So this was ordered by the Surveyor General of Paris. And basically, they spent their time drawing what you're seeing, which is literally a map of the city. Every building with its name, every street. Why is this important as a historical artifact? Why might you make a plan of your city or your town or your community? In case you want to build something new. In case you want to build something new so that you know what's there, what else? So you don't get lost in it, right? What else? Good. It basically gives you a historical document that allows you to track changes over time. And this is particularly important for cities like Paris, which are super, super old, or even a city like Ada, right, or Lima, where as the city changes and grows, what it looked like at the time changes and grows. This is actually with a team in Paris who they weren't just interested in identifying all the features in the city. That, those sounds you heard are actually recreations of the city in 1739. So what you were listening to is as the map moves and changes, you hear the sounds that somebody living in Paris in 1739 would have heard. How is that important digital history? To hear what someone heard in 1739. Why does sound matter? Senses. It's one of our major senses. It's one of the ways we orient ourselves, right? It's like when your parent yells at you. You know what parent is yelling at you just by the tone and the sound of their voice. But why else does sound matter? Go ahead. You can tell where things are coming from. So this team of scholars basically is doing things like layering sound over the spaces in order to understand things like if an orator, a speaker, was standing on a street corner yelling about God and the coming of you know, the Third Reich or whatever, well, 1739, so it's more like the coming of the French to take over the poor. If they're standing on the street corner yelling, how far did their voice carry? Who heard it? Who could have heard it, right? What's interesting or fun about this for me this is a French example. We actually have examples. I'm going to pull this down for a second. If it'll let me out. Okay. Um, we actually have this. We actually have examples of this for um, places like Chicago. So, who's been to Chicago? What does Chicago look like for you now? Hugely busy. Lots of buildings. Lots of places. Who's been to the Museum of Science and Industry? What is the Museum of Science and Industry like? Do you remember? It's a big, giant building, right? What if I told you, in 1898, the Museum of Science and Industry was actually one of the smaller buildings around that area? And in fact, that there was a 320-acre 
city built around the Museum of Science and Industry. Who knows in 1898 what that city was? The college students might. What is it, Russ? White city. The White City, the Columbian Exhibition. In 1898, America hosted a world's gathering of nations to show how great every nation was. So they built lots of buildings, and I'll show you guys once we get through this since it won't exit out for me. Um, they built lots of buildings, and part of what they built was designed to be temporary. They literally, at the end of the fair, so this thing ran for almost three years. It had millions upon millions of visitors. Um, it had all kinds of really cool things like Women's Day. They had Blacks Day, by the way, which is what they called African Americans at the time, um, where famous African American orders stood up and gave speeches about the importance of freedom for African Americans. It was a massive, massive building project. And the day after the fair closed, they lit it on fire and burned that shit down. <laughs> Kid you not. The fair organizers weren't the ones who intended to burn it down. It became basically a homeless camp after they moved the fair out. And at night, it got cold. And what do people who are homeless do when it gets cold? When you have no shelter, you light fires. And they literally burned the entire white city to the ground, with the only building still standing being the Museum of Science and Industry. Why? Because it was built with steel beams. So steel didn't burn, the fire didn't get hot enough. What's cool about that, and I'll show you guys this in a second, is a friend of mine at UCLA has actually built it so that you can live drive the entire 320 acres of the Columbian Exhibition. You can stand where Thomas, Ed Thomas Edison stood when he turned on the light bulb for the first time. That's kind of cool. You can also stand, by the way, in front of the Pabst Blue Ribbon Experiment which is where Pabst got its name. It won the blue ribbon at the fair. And you can literally watch, she's actually got one on the side where you can um, sort of gaze through the experiments. And one of the things that you can th do is look at things like people drinking a beer, people having tea, right? So she's recreating the city and she's populating it with the visitors themselves. All right. So, at this point, you're saying this is cool and all, but what does this actually have to do with digital history? Like, this is all way beyond my expertise, right? Like, this seems hugely complicated, hugely problematic. I gotta have lots of computer training. So I wanna show you a couple of things that are a little bit closer to home. What is this a map of? And it's a little hard to see. Does anybody know what this is a map of? That is Ohio. And it's a city near you right now. It's Lima, Ohio. This is a project called Mapping Inequality. And we'll go out to the live version. And of course, I don't want to go. Let's see if we can get out. There we go. All right. This is a project called Mapping Inequality. And what it does, that's my nephew, sorry. You can see the small child who likes to spit at me now that he's 12. <laughs> this is Mapping Inequality. We're gonna drive in. All right. This is Lima, Ohio. So you're trying to locate yourself, right? Trying to find your communities. This is a project, that's my street, right? This is where you guys are from. This is a project where a bunch of historians took digital federal data about housing patterns. So what it's called housing and urban development money. And basically what they did was they began to identify using census data and housing and urban development data, which area of the city do you want to live in? So, when you pull out, take a look at this side. A is the best. B is still desirable. Yellow is C, definitely declining, and D is hazardous. So some of you are green. Who's green? Who lives in green? Who's over here? Who's on the, on the west side of Lima, Ohio? Lives on the west side. 
Yep. All right. What about yellow? Who might live in a yellow area? Definitely declining. This is the southeast side. What do you think this information is used for? It's used for retail. It's used for retail, yes, kind of. Retail of a specific type. Housing. Housing. This information is actually used to set your mortgage rates. So when your parents or you go to buy a house, this was historical information that a bank would look up and say, well, I'm sorry, you live in the red area, and we're going to make your mortgage ridiculously expensive because you live in an area that's deemed or is not considered safe or productive or useful. What does that mean? What does that mean that your area gets deemed someplace unsafe or where house values are very low and we're going to charge you lots of interest? What does that do to somebody trying to buy a house in that area? You don't buy the house in that area. You can't afford to live there. Or what it also does is concentrate people together who can't afford things, right? So it's quite likely that if you lived in the green area in 1940, you had good access to good schools and good water, things like um, grocery stores and markets, that areas that were deemed red did not have. I'll give you a tip too. The red areas most often are around what's called heavy industry, things like trains, train tracks, or today the airport, so planes fly over your head all the time, right? This project mapping inequality is actually doing this on every city in America. So when you go up and pull out, you can actually do this on every city that they've got data for, and they're adding more and more cities. How does this matter as digital history? Imagine you're doing an oral history of somebody who grew up here in Lima in the 1940s. So at this point, that's probably your grandparents or great-grandparents. What, what if you were doing oral histories with them? What would this allow you to do? Good. So basically, you'd be able to say, I can locate my oral history interview into a particular neighborhood. And because they're in a red neighborhood or a yellow neighborhood, there might be questions that I need to ask them that are not the same questions I ask somebody who lives in a green neighborhood. Make sense? Cool, right? I got one other that's kind of close to home. Well, a couple hundred miles away. What this is? What is Ferguson? Ferguson, Missouri. Who knows about the events of Ferguson, Missouri? A cop shot an unarmed black teenager, young adult. And what happened afterwards? Depending on who you ask, some people say there were protests. And other people say there were riots. As a digital historian, the question is, whose history are you going to tell? So if I want to tell a history of riots, who are some of the people I might want to talk to or some of the data I might look for? The police officers, police reports, what else? Government officials, business owners, store owners. People who were there, oh, there you go. White people who weren't part of the protest, right? White folk, and particularly white folk who don't live in Ferguson. This is a pretty cool project that was started by Wash University in St. Louis, where a librarian and a couple of other people, along with some students, were really, really frustrated with the depiction of their town and of their community in the national news. Because every time they turned on the news, they heard all about Riots and racists, right? Basically, they were like, this is not my town, this is not my community. And so what they did was they created a crowdsourced archive for Ferguson. This is documenting Ferguson. It allows any member anywhere 
to upload information about what they participated in, what they saw. So think about it. How many of you guys carry your cell phones around with you all the time? You take lots of photos, right? This basically allows people to upload all kinds of things from Ferguson. Pictures they saw, things they saw, interviews and photos. So let's pick one and we'll... So here you go, this is a good one. This is actually a painting on the side of a building in Ferguson. And so they collect some information about when it was created, about who they, you know, who sort of wants to do it. But you get the original image. This is Dale Gebhardt, hands up, let's pray. And has no geolocation information attached to it. He says it's in Ferguson, but I'm not going to tell you where. How is this a form of oral history interviews or of local history? Go ahead. It's all of these individuals telling their own stories about what happened and what they saw in Ferguson. Why does that matter? Why does it matter as a digital historian that you might want to collect the broadest possible perspective of history? Yeah. So part of it can be about providing space where you counteract bias, right? So if you're only looking at police records, it's likely not to tell you what the, what the person who was being arrested thought or felt or what they were sort of, sort of fighting against. What would be a good sort of local parallel to this? So what, imagine us doing something similar. What type of project might you do as high school and college students here in Lima and Ada that, that does this? approach this. Imagine doing this with a school dance or with the football team or with your group of friends and where they get out, right? This is a way, by the way, and there's all kinds of controversy about this project. When they put this project up, it was basically a project what they call community healing, a way for people in the community to make clear sort of what they witnessed and what they experienced without censorship, right? Without bias, without people telling them what they had to think about it, the way the news was or the way um, members of the government were, were sort of enforcing them. What became really interesting is when the project went live, one of the first people to knock on their door were the police in Ferguson. What did they want from this project? They were okay with it staying up, but what did they want access to? Oh, uh, who posted what? They wanted to know who posted what photo. When, where, and why. Why might they want to know who posted what? Many of the photos included things that can now be considered illegal or were considered illegal at the time. So people breaking windows, people breaking and lighting cars on fire. The police wanted access to this archive because they wanted to find the people who they said committed the crimes. So think about all the things you do every day that could be considered a crime. Speeding, um, depending on who you're lying to, lying, right? This project had to basically confront or deal with the notion that what they were doing for the good of the community could actually be used against them. That's a hard way to say that what you've done as an oral historian or a digital historian could be used to convict someone else of a crime, right? So one more, and I want to show you Lisa's. This is that Chicago Columbian Exhibition Tour. It takes a second to load. This is from Lisa's project at UCLA. Um, we've been friends for a really long time. She's working on this, by the way, since 1997, which is probably older than some of you in the room. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, this it basically is an entire 3D recreation of a missing city, a city that no longer exists in Chicago. So what are some missing places that you've encountered that you could do this with? Huh? So you could do this with specific spaces and events, so like recreating the Oklahoma basketball game if you wanted to, using that footage. Um, Olympic Games. You could recreate the Olympic Games, right? So you could take all the spaces. What about things like your house gets killed by a tornado and you want to create a 3D recreation of your house? 
You could do that with this type of technology. By the way, this is all free technology that you can download onto your computer right now and get started with. It's pretty cool. You can also create fictional places with this type of stuff. So I have friends who work in literature who like to like take all the fake places that are in books and make them real. So they're doing this with things like the Tolkien novels, right? Or with um, Shakespeare. There is actually, this is what Disney does for Harry Potter, by the way, when they create things. This is the same exact technology that allows you to create. They do it at a much higher level and with a lot more money. Um, but what's cool about this is you can live drive this and you can actually stop on the ground and talk about it. She's also creating something called the um, Midway Exhibition, by the way, which is where they put all the people they wouldn't allow into the white city. That includes all of the Africans and all of the natives and all of the people that they felt weren't good enough to sort of make it into the city. Um, and part of what I like about it is she's actually recreating something called the Roundup, which happened every day where they would recreate battles between um, US troops and native people which is what I work on. Um, and you can actually watch recreations of those roundups. Um, these, by the way, are famous gardens. Um, that's part of the reason why they're in this. Pretty cool. OK, so one more thing, and then we will be good to go. So Ferguson and these types of things allow us lots of opportunities, mapping inequality, to do local histories, local digital histories. They don't take a lot of work. This, by the way, is driven by basically a WordPress site, no different than any other WordPress site. It's really easy to like do a one-click install and get it up and running. Um, this is actually um, something called a Mecca with a different front end. But the question for you guys is this. What does this mean for each of you? What does digital history mean? What's the promise of it um, for each of you? So who uses Twitter in this room? Thank you. Who uses Instagram? Who uses Google? Who has a cell phone from AT&T, Sprint, or Nextel, or any, anybody carrying a cell phone? How many of you guys are logged onto the internet right now? OK, I have a, a thing to break to you. Right now, you are creating digital history by sitting here in this room. How? Your location is being tracked by your cell phone provider. I can triangulate where you are to a span of about five meters in this room. What else? Yeah. We are also creating our uh, website to access it. It keeps a record of that on your server. Good. Your internet provider keeps a, a record of every single place you visit on the internet, which is problematic for some people. Why? Because you really don't want people to know that you look at photos of crazy cats all day, right? Like, that's really not a good way to tell history. What else is problematic or what else is interesting about these sites? What else do they do for you in terms of creating digital history? When you log on to Facebook or Twitter, until yesterday, Facebook and Twitter and Instagram, and set up your account, what do you agree to do? You agree to release all of the information, not just about yourself, but about? your friends and family, and all of the information related to the images or the things that you post. What does that mean for you? Your business is out there whether you like it or not. What does that mean for a digital historian or why is that important? Good. It used to be to do digital history, I had to go into an archive and digitize the record and then do all of these things to it, right? But now, because of computers, the way we access computers on our phone, the next historian who comes behind me who wants to write your history is not going to be looking for your journal or is not going to be looking for you know, photographs hidden in your house, um, is likely not going to be doing things like following you around to take pictures of what you've done. They're going to run algorithms against the internet and they're going to scour it for digital traces of you. What does that mean for digital history? It's gotten a lot easier. It's gotten a lot easier in some ways, but it also means what? If you're creating 20,000 data points a day, which is what they estimate most people create, what does that mean? 20,000 data points per person in this room, what does that mean? The cultural record, they think, is going to be 100 million times larger in a single year than the previous 100,000 years. What does that mean? We create more data in a single day than most years ever before. 
So if I'm a digital historian, my first job is not to ask, what is digital history? My first job is to ask, how do I weed through all the crap people created to find the thing that matters, right? So if I want to tell the history of Ferguson, where do I want to start? I probably want to start with that digital project first, because it's going to tell me lots of things about who was involved and what was going on. What about if I wanted to tell your digital history? Or the digital history of your family? I'd be looking at Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. I'd be looking for you on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. I also might be looking for you on something called Ancestry.com. What is Ancestry? Oh, it tells about your genealogy. It's a genealogical site, and it does something really interesting. How many of you guys have taken a DNA test? Oh, we've got one. We've got two. What do they do when they take a DNA test? They swab your mouth and they're looking for who are your parents, but also who are your other extended relatives. What's interesting about this for us is that it used to be when we talked about digital history, we only talked about physical artifacts or even these little digital things. Now when we talk about digital history, we're also talking about your biological data. So my parents, against my better advice, did a DNA test for Ancestry.com and they sent it to Ancestry. What does that mean for me as a person? They have basically my entire genetic blueprint out in a commercial vendor who can use that information to tell me things like I might have long lost siblings or might not actually be related to the people I think I'm related to. Why is this a problem for digital history or a problem for us as historians? It's because we're no longer making decisions about what's private and what's public. A lot of times we're making decisions about what's private and what's public by what platform we choose or what business we support. So I use Google a lot. Google has the right to use anything I do on it for its own purposes. And I will tell you how scary this is, that a friend of mine uploaded some photos to her Google Drive and then like three months later found out that they were using them for like business sales. Like her and her kid were like a backdrop to something, right? But she'd agreed to it by using the platform. So for us, the question about the promise of digital history is really a question about what you want to do with it, right? So you're going to start with these oral histories. You're going to start with projects about your school. But the question becomes, to what end? Why does this matter? What should you care about? So why might you care about doing some oral histories? Why might it be important to capture what your day-to-day -day life is or what your school's life was like? Why do we care? You can learn from it. Okay, so that's like the, the virtuistic reason, right? Like, it's important that we understand ourselves and the people around us, right? What are other reasons why you do this? Why do you care? Why should someone give you the time to do an interview? I was stretching. Uh, well, you're not supposed to stretch during question and answer. Sorry. It's okay. Why should you do this? Obviously, you got to do it for credit for school, right? Like, that's why a lot of people are in it. But why else? It can benefit you. How might it benefit you? Information that you might not have. Good. You develop empathy by doing digital history because you're interviewing and you're engaging with people who are not like yourself. Right? So I have no clue what it was like growing up in the 60s for my mother. But by interviewing her and asking her and talking to her about what she encountered and what she engaged with, you learn lots of all cool things. Not the least of which is she met my dad by falling down drunk underneath a table. Um, you learn lots of cool things about people and you can learn things that you may not know. For example, your parents might have participated in protest marches, which doesn't align with your parents at all. Or things like you might have unknown relatives. Um, or things that your family doesn't talk about. Digital history is a whole spectrum of things, right? So we talked about or started at the beginning with these really crazy 3D recreations. We added some sounds. We showed you what's hidden behind paintings. But digital history really is just about figuring out what you care about and going and doing some research and talking to some people about it. So I care about sport, and you're going to hear from Andrew in a minute about sport. I care a lot about like, how people experience things and why it matters to understand that whiteness is not natural and it's something that we preserve and use. So I do lots of interviews with native people about the ways in which they encounter people who think that they're different, right? 
digital history matters. And it's really cool because you get to do cool things like build 3D models. You get to do cool things like they take you into medical labs and show you how to recreate hearts. They let you do things like paint death masks of people. So I can pull down Abraham Lincoln's dead face and print it out as an object and give it to people. Kind of cool. But it also does things like send you around the world so you get to go really cool places and have them show you things that you've never seen before. And that's the promise of digital history for me was I got really tired of people telling me we don't research these types of things here. And so I became a digital historian to do the things that I cared about, which was tell lots of really crazy, insane stories and argue about who's right and wrong. Right? So we start with Abraham Lincoln, which is where I started as a 10-year-old. My mom bet me I couldn't read all 435 Abraham Lincoln books in our public library in Dayton, Ohio. I read all 435 books in the single summer, and because of that, she had to take me on a trip. That's why I became a digital historian. Right? All right, questions about any of the projects you've seen or things that you want to know about that we haven't talked about. Trust me, I can talk for years about all types of digital history. Visualizations, 3D recreations, music, song, yeah. How far back does your history archive go? It depends on the project. So I work with some people who are doing what's called historical archaeology, which is basically a way of they go out and they use digital technologies to map the literal dead civilizations underneath the ground. So like um, the Ohio mounds, they'll go out there and they will use digital imaging to basically identify what's underneath the ground layer. Um, they're part of a team of archaeologists who do this across the globe who discovered things, for example, like hidden ruins in cities where the jungle has grown over top of them. So it can go as far back as, you know, like, I guess it's 100 BC is the earliest that they've done, which is stuff down in Israel and Palestine. Um, but it kind of depends. Most of my stuff is focused in the late 19th and early 20th century. Um, that's what I care about. So I'm working on a project where we're taking legal records from the U.S. District Court um, about slave petitions for freedom. So slaves had to petition the court to be um, enumerated from their masters, let go from their masters. And we're digitizing all of those slave petitions for the courts. And we're looking, for example, about who they were talking to, who the lawyers were, sort of recreating African-American life in the early, to, in the early 19th century. Um, so sort of 19th and 20th century is most of my stuff. Other questions? <laughs> By the way, I have a friend who does this up to the minute with Twitter. Um, where he actually is mining Twitter data as it comes in to look at what people care about in history. Um, and I'll give you a really interesting sort of thing, which is you'd be amazed at the number of people who don't realize that you can actually capture Twitter data. So they say something and they think no one's ever going to see it again. And then they show up in a presentation like this where someone's pointing out the horribly racist or, or misogynistic or sexist thing someone said about um, in this case, what he was looking at was Rachel Maddow yesterday, because Rachel Maddow released Trump's tax returns, and so he was looking at how Twitter talked about Rachel Maddow. Other questions? Cool things? So, two hours or two and a half hours away from here, you have IUPUI, which is where I'm from. We teach students how to do all of these things so that they're prepared to have jobs in museums and libraries and archives. So if you're interested in these things, you can definitely come to Ohio Northern and do that, get your undergrad, and then come see me for your graduate degree um, and learn how to do this specifically for a job. Anything else? Other questions? Things you want to know? My students can ask questions too, you know. <laughs> you're not really a <laughs> So I will tell you one of my hobby projects just as we end, um, I'm a sport historian. I grew up in a family of athletes. My dad's the fifth winningest soccer coach in, st in the state of Ohio. Um, my sister and brother were both college basketball and soccer players. I sit on the athletic affairs board for IUPUI, which basically means we pr provide oversight um, for our athletic programs. One of the things I'm fascinated by is actually recreating basketball games. Um, and so we've been talking about how to model things that no longer exist. So my advisor does this with baseball recreating baseball stadiums and basketball stadiums that no longer exist so that we can repopulate them with the fans so that we can think about things like how fans encountered the game and saw the game using old school photos. So I bored you to death. There's lots of things that you can do. Lots and lots of things.
And I will tell you, by the way, for those of you guys who like music, there's an entire genre of this that's about just about music, and is doing things like tracking use and reuse of musical melodies and lyrics. So for example, pulling Kanye West and connecting Kanye West to Bach. Yeah. Or Justin Bieber, for example, and connecting Justin Bieber to the sounds of Motown in the 1950s. There's something you'd never think you'd hear about Justin Bieber. Right? So following sampling and understanding sampling as a historical artifact. All right, anything else? Things you care about, you want to know about? All right, enjoy. I will answer questions afterwards when we break if you have things. All right. We've got a few minutes before our next speaker, so if you want to, um, oh, important thing, bathroom straight back to either side. Uh, if you need to use the